I kneel down, I trigger this device, the device explodes. There was no warning, you knelt on it and it exploded. Now I was in no pain, I couldn't see anything, didn't know what had happened, so I thought, we're under attack. I, I realized that I wasn't moving. I knew that my body wasn't doing what my brain was telling it to do and I couldn't understand why. I looked down to where my legs should have been and they had both been completely just ripped off. So I'm with my good friend, Mark Ormod. And for those of you who don't know him, um, which won't be many of you, I'm sure you would have seen him around, seen his documentary on Amazon and his incredible, inspiring story. So I just want to give a bit of background how I got to know Mark. So about, I would say about 11 years ago, I was invited to some kind of entrepreneurs awards show where we give a little speech and we give out awards to these teenagers who've done extremely well on their course. I can't, it was in Cornwall somewhere. And um, when I arrived in the foyer initially, and I arrived actually early for a change, which is rare for me, I met Mark. And I gotta be honest with you, I had nothing really pointed out to me. I didn't know, didn't know Mark. I didn't notice any of his disabilities. He was in a suit, he looked, he looked absolutely normal, was walking around. And then later on in the evening, he sat next to me at the show and I realized uh, he had a hook coming out of his arm. And then he very, very jokingly he called himself that he was like a pirate, he's a hook, and he was joking about it and so on. And, and um, yeah, then I realized he had no legs. Then I realized he just got one arm, that's it. So I had my speech, it went down very well. And I knew I was going to get crushed by this guy. I mean, there's no one's got more of an inspirational story about him than than any than Mark has, and he he pretty much stole the show. I might as well not have turned up that night. <laughs> he got the stand innovation. He's got all the jokes and stuff, and he tells his story really well. Afterwards, I, I was trying to do my usual motivational self because Mark was in a bit of a dark place. I was in a dark place back then too. My mum was dying of breast cancer. She died about three months later, going through a divorce. And um, the battle to get to see my children was, was difficult at the time. Some people experienced you're going for that initial stage of the divorce. So I thought I was going for a bad time. And then I realized that, nah, I'm not going for a bad time. Look what this guy's overcome. And I wanted to try and inspire Mark in the way. And, and I, I kind of knew it was hard to do. So he told me about before his injuries, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment, gave him to explain. He was very much into bodybuilding, weight training, and he was very much into martial arts. So being Mr. Positive, I said to Mark, yeah, you can do martial arts. There's a way we can work it out. There's got to be a way. We, we adjust it for deaf people and blind people, which we do. People in wheelchairs, which we do. But I've never, honestly, I didn't tell him this, but I've never seen it before with somebody with just one limb. So I was trying to motivate him. He wasn't having any of it by any account. He just wiped it out. It knocked me dead. How the hell can I do weight training, Matt? Look, look at me. You know, in one arm, literally, that's all I've got. How can I do martial arts now? That's over. That ain't ever going to happen. And you know, he was he was depressed. I, I think it was safe to say he was in a bit of a dark place. It's about 2011, I would say, 2012, possibly. Yeah, 2012, I think. I guess he, he wasn't in a great place. He was um, going through the motions of this this situation that he's found himself in, coming out of the injury, doing public speaking. Just like me, I have a story and I have to tell it all the time. You get sick to death for telling the same old story, but it does inspire people. I know Mark, he's told me he gets tired of it as well, but he understands the, the impact it, it has. But what I was happy to see is that a few years later, Mark went on to do well. I saw he started training in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, jiu which I'm really impressed with. I saw him training with weights initially, and I thought, this is going somewhere. Then I saw him entering the Invictus Games, which he'll tell you all about that. Then I saw him with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And then I saw his documentary and I thought, fair play to you, you know, unbelievable. So I, I thought I was going for a rough time back then. I, some of you refer to as my comeback years and how I grew the business, come out of those dark times. Nah, this guy has come from unbelievable setbacks where most people, if I'm honest, would probably would have called it a day. And I'm going to ask him a minute if he ever thought about that put a rope around your neck and just call it a day. Because uh, what he's what he's come from, from where I saw him back then, 
to where he is now is nothing more than phenomenal, really. Absolutely incredible. So please welcome Mark to the Mount Finesse show. And uh, Mark, I don't know where we're going to start. So can we start maybe about our first meeting? What was going on in your mind back then? Then we'll, then we'll dive into what happened. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think it was about 2009, maybe 2010. Um, and we were both invited along to the award show, give out some awards to the kids. And it was kind of, I, I was in a bit of a weird place where I, as far as I remember, I was still serving. I was still in the Marines and I was in that transitioning out phase, not really knowing what it was I was going to do in my life. And everyone kept telling me, you know, just do public speaking, travel the world, tell your story and uh, try and inspire people. Now, I, I really didn't see any other option, which is one of the reasons that I was there. I was, I was trying to break into that world, see if I was any good at it, develop my skills at it. Um, and yeah, like you said, we, we met in, I think it was the lobby we met in. I think we sat outside before we'd actually right. gone in. And you told me a bit about your story. I told you a little bit about mine, my background with, with kickboxing and Muay Thai and boxing and all that lot. But like you just said, you know, I wasn't in a great place. Um, there was a lot going on. A lot I was still trying to figure out. A lot I wasn't motivated to do. And I guess you, you could say I was lost in a way, just confused and overwhelmed and lost, just trying to piece my life back together and, and figure it all out. And at that time, speaking was really the only thing that I thought that I could do. Um, but as you just said, you know, over the years, mate, as, um, as things progressed, it's, it's amazing what having a, a positive mindset can do and, and a direction to go in. Things have just gone phenomenal, you know, and um, I've gone from that dark place to, to where I am now. And it's been, it's been a journey, mate. It's been a journey, you know, like, like you've been on yourself. Highs, lows, peaks, troughs, great times, terrible times. But that's all part of it, and that's what makes the whole thing interesting. Yeah, I think it was safe to say that. I would describe you as quite angry back then. You were angry with what happened and what was taken away from you, which, which was your life, your fitness, your identity was ruined. And you had all this respect from your, your peers and your fellow Marines and everyone else, but you, didn't, you weren't having any of it. You know, you, you were just quite an angry soul back then and uh yeah I, I drove away that night mark i was a little bit worried about you i was worried about where you were going to go because anything positive i said you just knocked me back straight away and i, and I was thinking dear me you know but in my own head did, did i believe that you could go back into martial arts and uh weight training no i didn't really mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't i was just trying to say that to pump you up and give you some hope but you found a way, you know. So let's let's dive back into what happened. So most people, so if you're listening to this, it's obviously not really going to be um, a bit of an uh, issue to you. But for most people, when you're watching this on YouTube, you can't see here, but Mark's just got one limb. I don't know, Mark, can you give everyone a bit of a whirl? Yeah. No, that's, just, uh, that's the upper he's limb. He's just got an arm. He's got no legs. And mm -hmm. his other arm's gone. So do you want to tell everyone the story? I know you're sick of telling this story, and I understand that because I've got to tell my whole story about me and Michael Jackson every time I uh, get interviewed and martial arts and bullied yeah. at school and the whole thing. Uh -huh. But, yeah, if we can cover that, because I know it's very inspiring for people, and then um, let's move on to the good stuff. Well, I'll, I'll try and give you the quick version of it, if you want. Okay. Um, <laughs> just so we can move on to some of the cool stuff. But in essence... You know, I'm a former Royal Marines commando. I, I joined the Marines when I was 17 years old, back in 2001. Finished my training later that same year uh, after I turned 18. And four weeks after, the world witnessed the tragedies of 9-11. I was, I was literally stood in the diner on my camp. I'd finished all the, the real physical side of our training, so 30, nearly 30 weeks. And we were just doing the ceremonial side of stuff, the, the marching around. And we were taking a break. Me and all the troop were in the diner eating some pizza. And then we saw the Twin Towers thing happen. So we kind of knew straight from the get-go that as soon as we'd done the ceremonial side of things in like a week or two's time, we're probably going to go out to war. And uh, 
that's pretty much what happened. You know, 2002, uh, I was trained to go out to Afghanistan or something called Operation Chicana. I didn't end up actually going. So I stayed in the UK. I went to Norway a couple of times, did some Arctic warfare training, some exercises down in America. But then 2003 came around uh, when I was 19 and I deployed to Iraq on what was called Operation Telic One. So I was involved in that initial push over the Kuwait Iraqi border. We went into a place called Azerbaijan Naval Base. The lads went up to the palace and the oil fields. And we spent three and a half months in Iraq. Um, and I came back a little bit disappointed. No, that's probably not the right word. Um, like deflated maybe, might be a better word. But I had this image in my head of what combat was and what war was. And for me, Iraq didn't really meet that image. Um, and, you know, you, you're trained to be this elite level soldier, one of the most elite on the planet. So you think when you go to these places, you're going to be the first in, kicking the doors down, doing all this stuff. And, and the majority of the time, that's exactly what you do do. But for some reason, Iraq for me was a bit like, oh, okay, that was it. And then I came home. So I left shortly after that. After my minimum five years, I left the Marines to pursue a career as a bodyguard. That didn't turn out very well. Um, so I ended up going back into the Marines in 2007. And then September that year, I deployed to Afghanistan for the first time for the six month tour. Now, Afghanistan was the polar opposite of Iraq. Like we hit the ground and just from the minute your boots hit the ground, you're, you're dodging bullets, bombs, you're out in patrols. It, it was just intense, like super kinetic from the minute that you hit the ground. Now, the short version of this story is that halfway through that tour on Christmas Eve 2007, I was out on one of our routine foot patrols. I was second in command of a section of eight men. On the way back into camp, we were given cover, what we call overwatch, for another group of eight men that we'd been out patrolling with. They were going to go back into the camp, get behind the perimeter wall where they were safe. They would cover us. We could peel back into the camp because it's all, you know, this is basic low level stuff that we've done a million times before. But as we were getting into positions, I was giving the lads their fire positions. When I was happy that we were covered and we were as defensive as we possibly could be, I went to go and get into my fire position. And as I put my right knee on the floor, I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device, which instantly took off both my legs and my right arm. And then a very adrenaline fueled chaotic evacuation <laughs> took place after that. Now, I, I remember everything and I'm happy to, to walk you through it if you want. Absolutely, if you can. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So I kneel down, I trigger this device, the device explodes. If you can imagine the terrain in Afghanistan, it's very sandy, very dusty. So when this device exploded, there's a huge dust cloud created. So temporarily, I can't see anything. I can hear everyone around me shouting, trying to make sure everyone's okay and figuring out what's going on. But my gut instinct was that we had been attacked because I, I wasn't in any pain. Well, I didn't know what I'd done. It wasn't like a movie where you stand on it, it clicks and then explodes. There was no warning. You knelt on it and it exploded. Now, I was in no pain. I couldn't see anything, didn't know what had happened. So I thought, we're under attack. Now, I need to find out where the attack came from, start laying down some sort of suppressive fire make a tactical withdrawal with my section, get to a better position and then neutralize this threat. Now I knew that where I was, 600 meters or so behind me, down beneath us, there was a small rectangular forestry block and everything else around that area was just flat mud fields uh, that the, the farmers had been plowing. So in all that chaos, all that adrenaline, my first thought was, right, that's where the attacks come from, from the, the forestry block, because it's going to be difficult to see and difficult to engage somebody. They're not going to run out in an open field and just start firing 
mortar bombs or RPGs at us. So I started saying to myself in my head, you know, turn around, Mark, find where the enemy is, shoot, get everyone out there as safe as you can. But after about four times, like in my mind of saying, turn around, turn around, turn around, even though I couldn't see anything, I, I realized that I wasn't moving. I knew that my body wasn't doing what my brain was telling it to do, and I couldn't understand why. So I thought, okay, I'll wait. I'll wait for this dust cloud to settle. I'll have a look around, reassess the situation, make some quick calls on the ground, and then figure out what we're going to do. So the dust cloud got to about chest height, you know, and I am pumped full of adrenaline right now. I'm fighting, fighting. I'm looking around, just praying that, that none of my friends had been hurt or killed. I couldn't see any of them. I think they'd all been blasted out of the area. So I just carried on waiting. And then this dust cloud finally hit the floor and dissipated. And as it did, I looked down to where my legs should have been and they had both been completely just ripped off from the knees down. Now, it was, and anyone listening who's been in a traumatic incident will be able to relate to this, but it's a very surreal experience. You know, there's, there's no pain. Your body, your, sorry, your brain can't really process what it is that it's looking at. And it feels very surreal, almost like a dream. So I just remember sitting there kind of staring at where my legs should have been with all this blood and, and claret pouring out of me, but not being in any pain and trying to understand what was happening. I was like, okay, I can see what's happened. I'm not in any pain. Maybe this isn't real. You know, what, what, what's happening? But I very quickly snapped out of it, like two, two, maybe three seconds. I then remembered about the rest of my team. So I, I just, for some reason, just stopped looking, wasn't concerned about it. Started looking around for the rest of my team. Looked over my right shoulder and I saw... Uh, the section commander, my friend Sean Halsby, who I'd been through training with uh, back in 2001. And he was like clearly in shock. His face was, uh, there was no color in his face. He's very gray. And there's a lot going on, right, in my mind at this point. I'm thinking, what's going on with my legs? Why does he look like that? What's, are, we, are we under attack? I don't understand. And when I looked at his face, it kind of said to me, what you looked at just now, Mark, even though you can't process it, it's, it's real. But I still didn't believe it. So I went to look back at my legs to be like, okay, I understand what's going on now. I've processed this. Now what do we do? And as I started sweeping the ground my eyes, I got to like the three o'clock position and I saw my arm just like lying there in the sand. Now it was still attached, uh, but from my bicep down to my wrist, the entire thing was just ripped open. There was no bone in there. It had all been shattered completely. And I, for some reason, I kind of picked my hand up, which was still in quite good order. And I kind of looked at it. And then I just dropped it in the sand and just let out this massive scream as I started to understand actually what was going on. We weren't under attack. I had stood on an IED. My legs and arm were gone. I'm probably going to die now. We need to figure something out really quickly um, to try and get me out of this situation. Now, the ground that I was on, when we were taking cover, we were in this little bowl, and we were working with American Special Forces guys, and they went in and they have to clear the area after and write a report. Their report said that this device had erupted and it had caused a crater that was 12 feet deep by 15 feet around. So my evacuation, I, I knew, I just looking around, was going to be nearly impossible. And what I also knew was that all of the rest of my section were trained not to come running straight in to try and help me because they risk setting off further devices and either injuring myself further or killing me or injuring themselves or killing themselves. So I knew I'm in this horrendous crater in the floor which is going to be difficult to get me out of the lads are not going to come running in to help me because we're trained not to do that and there's blood pissing out of me everywhere at a rapid rate and i'm probably gonna black out and die in a minute now 
the one thing I will say, and I always say this, it was, this sounds really weird, right? It was phenomenal to be able to witness how professional those men were in that situation because, you know, nine times out of 10, when you drill this and practice it, you'll cock it up. But when you need to do it, when the pressure's on, everything just worked, slipped, and everyone did everything that they knew they were supposed to do. And this medic got to me in about, I don't know how long it was, but it, it, was, it was quick. And he got to me out of the camp, uh, up onto this high feature on, into this crater, started putting tourniquets on my leg, made me do the tourniquet up my arm to make sure I didn't just give up and die. He had to keep me active and responding to his, his questions. He got me stable, put his hands under my armpits, dragged me onto a stretcher that he had brought up. And that was the first time that I felt any pain. So uh, <laughs> I very politely asked him to put me down. And I looked down to my right leg where I felt the pain coming from. And there was like a thin piece of rope coming out of my thigh, like kind of snaking into the ground, covered in blood and claret and sand and dirt. And it went into my boot. And uh, again, I don't know why I did this, but I picked this boot up and had a look inside and my foot was still in the boot. And so where the medic had dragged me and the weight of the foot and boot, this tendon had, had stretched and caused me the pain. Wow. So we had to put my foot on my own stomach and evacuate me out of this crater. They then got me onto the main road where there was a vehicle waiting, threw me in the back of the vehicle and the guy driving, and these are not, you know, tarmac roads. These are just pothole sand roads where you're bouncing around. I was getting thrown around, smashing my head off of the back of this vehicle. And the guy starts going up this incline to go in the, the front gate of the camp to where the helicopter was called in to come and get me. And he's driving, you know, he's got to go hard left, hard right, really hit the accelerator at certain points because the ground was so loose that the vehicle would have slid back down if he didn't drive in the correct way. And he got to a point where he hit the accelerator and the doctor, the medic, fell out the back. Now, I fell out after him, but as my, the bottom of my spine hit the tailgate of the vehicle, the guy driving swang around, reached out, grabbed whatever he could to hold me in this vehicle and ended up grabbing my femur bone that was coming out my right leg. Now, I didn't feel any pain because the, the medic had already shot me full of morphine at that point. So I was on cloud nine. But we let, he left the medic, who was perfectly safe because there were eight heavily armed men at the bottom of this hill drove me to the helicopter landing site. And the last thing I can remember is the Chinook landing, the sandstorm that gets created from the propellers, the heat from the exhaust, and then like the mechanical noise of the tailgate as it dropped. And that was when I blacked out. And later on found out that they, the medics on the flight had, had classed me as dead. So, Pretty intense Christmas Eve. I've had better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, well, I'm trying to ask you some of the stuff you're not going to have to It's going to be quite difficult, I'd imagine. Okay. But, um, so, why no pain? What's the, the reason for that? I guess you've done... Is it the adrenaline took over? or this, I'm, I'm going to put it down to adrenaline. Um, on, on, you, you know what? Your body is phenomenal. It's like... This is not a very good comparison, but if I got a bit of paper now and put it on your fingers and I'm going to give you a paper cut, right? You're going to be like, ah! But have you ever got to the end of the day and you just looked at your hand and go like, oh, I've got to cut my knuckle. You don't know what's going to happen and you just don't register the pain. I didn't obviously know I was going to step on an IED. Then my adrenaline kicks in and, and all my body's chemicals are released to deal with it naturally. Then the mind kicks in as well. Like I said, it doesn't feel real, which I think helps massively with the pain. Uh, and so then the power of the mind, doesn't it? Because you are right. I know friends who cut their thumb off, and it isn't until they look at it that they start experiencing yeah. problems, pain, and so on. Up to that point, yeah. it's been 15 minutes, they've not even noticed it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's a strange situation. So, so your team, if you could put that something down to who saved your life that day, I, I know is the professionalism of your team and one particular person is in particular who weren't going to give up on you. I think that's that. You. And yourself, I don't think you really thought you wanted to die, did you? You had everything to live for and in your mind... Mm-hmm. You, so I'll tell you what's the, I'll tell you what's really weird about it, right? So I honestly didn't think that they'd be able to come in to get me because of the reasons I told you. Like the terrain was horrendous. We're trained not to do it. I'm bleeding a lot. And the logical part of my brain said, this is it. You know, you're going to die now. But like the rest of me was like, I know I'm going to be fine. And I, I can't explain why. The only reason I can think is that I had so much confidence in those men. I knew they'd do whatever it took. That I never really, I was so relaxed, like, inside. Like, you know, I, I know I'm going to be okay. There wasn't, like I said, there's no pain. That there, there was, it was very uncomfortable. Like, if you imagine the worst pins and needles you've ever got, and you times it by 15 million, you know, just throbbing. And, you know, so I was aware but I wasn't like screaming in pain. I was just relaxed. Like it's, it's very, very difficult to try and explain when you think of the circumstances. I just knew I was going to be okay. Did they go against the rules to come and get you then, Mark? There, there aren't any rules, really. You know, there's there's training and there's best practice, <laughs> but there's there's not any rules. Um, and they'll, like I said, they'll do whatever it takes. So yeah. they had a choice to leave you there and look after themselves or take that risk and go and get you. That, that would never have crossed their minds, mate. Like, literally, they, they would have done, and they did do whatever it takes. Sounds like you're surrounded by some incredible people. Yeah, and that's the key to life, mate. <laughs> Just make sure you're around good people. That is the key to life, too. So then then they obviously took you to a hospital. So, um, so from there on in, what happened? I mean, clearly you weren't transported to the UK right away, and... Your family had to be informed. I mean, what happened after that point? So they originally they flew me back to a place called Camp Bastion, to the field hospital there, which is still in Afghanistan. Um, and the surgeons there had to try and save me and stabilise me because they, they, I was the first person to survive losing three limbs. They'd never seen anyone in the mess that I was in. And again, these these guys and girls worked like solid and diligently for, for hours to save me. You know, it's not it's not just a case of chopping off limbs and bandaging them up. You got to get all the dirt and the sand out and reduce the infection risks. Keep my heart beating. Put blood back in me. Fluids in me. You know, they're just working like troopers to to save me. And uh, they did that in a tent, basically in Afghanistan, uh, in quite a quick amount of time because I got back to the UK to Selly Oak and Birmingham on I know there's a time difference between the UK and Afghanistan but I was I was back about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas day wow you know, so I was injured in Afghanistan about lunchtime Christmas Eve and I was back in the UK early hours of Christmas morning and your, family, your family were all informed yeah my um it, you know, you're never going to get it 100% right, but initially they were told I'd lost a foot. And then as they all gathered together and made their way up to the hospital, another phone call would be like, oh, actually, he's lost a leg. Oh, it might be two legs. Oh, it might be his arm as well. And then, you know, by the time they got to the hospital, they knew it was all three limbs above the joints. But, I mean, the great thing was that that was it no internal injuries to, you know, I've got friends who've had shrapnel tear their intestines and organs up, but no brain injuries, uh, no facial injuries, a couple of scars on my back and my chest where they put drains in and shrapnel barns and that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's just cosmetic. Um, when you woke up, Mark, in hospital, when you're fully together and you've been told what's happened and you're looking at your body, you've only got one arm left. And I guess it was still a little bit touch and go on, if you're going to get through this due to infection risks and all the mm-hmm. other stuff at any point, it's mental health month this month. So I want to bring this up. What kind of mindset were you in? And were you ever suicidal thinking just call it a day? Just I've had enough. I, I can't go on. Like, Cause you've lost your identity, haven't you? Completely. Lost everything, mate. 
my career, my identity, everything. But so one thing I'll say is the first seven days in intensive care, I still don't know if it was planned this way or if it was just luck. But the way they, so I was in a coma for three of those seven days. And when they woke me up over those other four days, they did it, they reduced the medication in such a perfect way that each day and each hour actually that I was, because I was constantly asleep awake, asleep awake because I was so exhausted. Every time I would wake up, it felt like I understood a bit more of my, my situation and could, could, un, could not accept it because it was too early for that, but understand it at the right level. You know, rather than waking up cold turkey and being like, damn, you're missing three limbs. It was like this gradual process. And by day seven, I was genuinely like, okay, I understand it now and I'm cool with it. Now, I wasn't ever like, this is too much. I'm stressed. You know, what's going on? And they moved me out of intensive care for seven days, straight up to the uh, a single man room where I was really like, I wasn't off medication, obviously, but I was out of the, off the most of the hallucinogenic style medication and just the pain relief stuff now. And, uh, it, yeah, it just worked, mate, where I could, I could wake up and be like, all right, this is shit, but I've, I've understood it over an, a decent time period. And now I need to figure something out and, and some sort of plan to move forward in my life. Now, no suicide thoughts. Right. So this is what I was going to come on to now. So three and a half weeks into it, I'm lying in hospital and I can only use two fingers because i got that huge scar on my hand where the shrapnel, I had a massive hole in my left hand. And uh, I could only use two fingers to pull myself up in bed and feed myself. And this doctor came in and I hadn't met him before as part of my team. He was an outside doctor, but he had been an amputation specialist in the UK, well, around the world for over 30 years. And he, he walked in and he basically explained to me that he had never met anybody who had one leg missing above the knee that had real success using prosthetics because it was too painful. It took too much energy and prosthetics were too difficult to use. So people just didn't bother. And that was someone with one leg missing above the knee. And I had two legs missing above the knee and I'd lost my dominant arm. So he, he basically told me to get ready for life in a wheelchair. And I was 24 years old, you know, and that night I, I contemplated suicide and I'm, I'm certainly not making light of, of suicide or people that think these thoughts, but I like three o'clock in the morning, I had to laugh at myself because I thought I can't even cut my own wrists because I've only got one fucking hand. <laughs> I just, I remember lying there, like just laughing at the irony of it. But then, you know, I woke up the next day and I'm like, right, let, let's try and figure this out. And like a week later, you know, and I struggled that week, a week later, a guy come to visit me who had lost both his legs above the knee in Iraq in 2005 and straight away I saw this guy and I'm like well that doctor didn't know what he was talking about because this dude's in here with two legs missing he had both his arms fine but this doctor told me that you can't have success with one leg missing above the knee this guy's got two and he just walked in my room so after he visited me I got my laptop and I got hooked up to the internet and started doing all my own research and looking for people who had injuries similar to mine as a, as a motivation and inspiration so when i went to rehab people said oh you can't do that mark i could go well this guy's done it so let's figure it out so that was the first time you know where i really felt bad and the second time i was in hospital for six weeks in total so it's probably week number five they let me out of the hospital they said i was clear of infections i was i wasn't a high risk at getting any infection so I can leave a clinical environment and go out to the flat that the military provided for my family to stay in. And it was in a tower block, right? So they, they took me out, they pushed me out and it just felt great, mate, to get out and get some fresh air, get out of that warm, clammy hospital environment. And we went over to the tower and we buzzed in the front door. They pushed me in my wheelchair, I was fine. We went through the front door of the flat and that was fine but I couldn't get in any of the rooms because I had a wheelchair, which is extra wide on one side. Cause I've only got one hand. You have to go left, right, forward and backwards with one hand. And it, I couldn't get in the rooms. So I had to sit in the hallway and like pee in a milk bottle 
and eat my dinner separate from everyone. And I just felt awful. Like, this is my life. I'm going to be excluded from so much stuff because I can't even fit into, like, the front room. And in the evening, we figured out, you know, my dad picked me up under my armpits. Someone collapsed the wheelchair, put it through. He put me in the chair in the other room. And I stayed with Becky that night. Uh, and I slept in the flat. And I cried all night. Uh, I, I, there was also the first time I saw myself in a full-length mirror. Uh, in the hospital, I'd only had the ability to see my from the neck up. And I wheeled past the mirror in the bedroom, saw my legs missing. My, my jumper was flapping. I'd gone from six foot two, 16 stone to, I think I was nine, under nine stone at the time. You know, three limbs missing. It's a bit of a shock. Yeah, I just didn't want to do it, mate. And I, and I cried all night. I was like, oh, I'm not doing this. You know, I'm going to figure something out. I think Becky is probably one of the most key people in your life, mm -hmm. other than the person who saved you after the accident, to give you something to live for. Because yeah. she, only you know and her know what, what she's gone through. But I guess, back of your mind, she ended up becoming your wife and um, got your children and so on. So I guess you had her to focus on. I guess she's a very positive person, right, Mark? She's, did, it ever, what, did you ever think at any time at, Becky's not going to hang around. Why she want to put up with this? You know, it's... I, I, I never did. I gave her the option to. That, really? that, that actual night, I gave her that option. And another couple of times since. Because, you know, I was 24. She was 21. She had just finished university, just got a degree. And I lived in Plymouth and she was from Surrey. So I'm like, right, this isn't going to work. You need to go back to Surrey and I'll go and figure this out somehow. But she stuck around, mate. And, um, you know, like, like you said, I, I'm a father of three. We, we, we've got two together, me and Becky. So, you know, we did that the old-fashioned way as well. So everything is working. I, 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 I've been at the events, Mark. They all ask that same question, don't they? <laughs> yeah, you, everyone put, wants to know. you beat them to it, don't you? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, people are too polite to ask, but they all want to know, you know, as is twig and giggleberry's been ripped off and they haven't and they, they work and you know i've got two two other kids to prove that um so again you're very was, proud of the old boy yeah but this is this was the key to it all for me mate it was like stop focusing on what you haven't got and focus on what you have got right like i said no facial injuries no internal injuries no brain injuries you know my pecker is still there it still works you know i i am very fortunate and i touch wood every time i say this but a lot of people assume that someone that's been through what I've been through suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I honestly don't. I don't have flashbacks. I don't, you know, wake up in the middle of the night. I don't hit the deck when I hear, you know, all those cliche things that you, you see, cars backfiring and panic attacks. I just feel very lucky that I've been able to focus on other things and keep driving forward and, and just use it as an opportunity for growth. I take it naturally they would have put you on antidepressants and sedatives and stuff. Did they have sleeping tablets? Uh, in hospital, you know, you needed a, a bit of that. I don't think antidepressants, but I, I got rid of my medication very early on. I wasn't a fan of it. I put on a lot of weight. I couldn't mm -hmm. string a sentence together. And I remember I came home one day and I'm sat on my chair. It was a Friday and I just had this big round chair that was like my chill out chair when I'd done a week in rehab and I was coming home for a couple of weeks sick leave. And I was looking at the TV and for some reason I was looking at the, the top corner where the plastic is and I wasn't actually watching the telly and I'm looking at it and I'm having this conversation with myself. I'm the only one in the house. Becky was at work. The, the kids weren't born then. And I'm looking at this plastic and I start saying to myself in my head, Mark, look at the TV. Why are you staring at the plastic? Look at the TV. Watch what's on. Three hours went by before I snapped out of it. And I started looking at the TV and I was like, right, I'm getting rid of the medication because this is shy. I can't function. And I literally flushed it all in that moment. And I thought, if I wake up tomorrow and I'm in a lot of pain, I'll figure something out. I'll, I'll go in to the doctor and I'll start getting smaller dosages. And I woke up the next day, nothing. Woke up the next day, nothing. Woke up the next day, nothing. And I'm like, why have I been taking? I was taking 18 for breakfast, 18 for lunch and 18 for dinner. And I'm like, why was I taking all that stuff? I'm not even in any pain. And that was it. I just cold turkey ditched it and, and carried on with my rehab without that. 
I did the same thing. Like my wife made me. She says either the medication or me when I when I was uh, with her, and she she flushed it all down the toilet too. Mm. And I, to me, when my mum was being buried, there was no emotion. I couldn't cry if I wanted to. It's almost like a scream was put in front of me. Mm. And also, I'm not telling people to go and flush your medication down the toilet. That's the worst advice you could be given. But the um, yeah, I didn't find there was much difference to being on it and off it. And at some point, you got to deal with the the situation anyway, Mark, haven't you? You've got to sit there and deal with it. You can't keep masking the problem forever. No. And um, the label PTSD and stuff, they, they recently that they tried to put that on me. So I had a traumatic three years, nothing like you've gone through, dear me. But yeah, is it a label? Are they giving them out a bit too much lately? You know, is it every child in my martial arts schools, they seem to come in labeled with ADHD or autism. Maybe mm. they're just a little bit naughty or got too much energy and they, they want to be out there or they're talented, you know, they're athletic. And this is where physical activity is a game changer. Channel. Like the depression, uh, anxiety, whatever it is. Like, I, I wish when you went to the doctors, that's what they prescribed. Instead of giving you the pill bottle, they went, right, go find a trainer and go kick your ass for a couple of weeks in the gym and see if you're feeling better. Do you know what I mean? And that, that for me is the very, that's the foundation. You can then build on that with everything like your habits, routines, what you consume content wise, people you hang around with, you know, the, the way you build your life around that. But physical activity, that's been the, the thing for me. I think that's why I've kind of gone down a different path because I was very much straight into the physical side of things and just expending all that negativity out of my system. That's who you were before the injuries, wasn't it? That was your identity. That's who you were. Yeah. You trained your ass off. You. Mm. In every area, martial arts, training, and so on. So what happened then, from us being at a war show, with you being Mr. Negative, telling me, no way I could do martial arts, look at me. And you called yourself the hook then and made a bit of a joke out of it. Mm. I didn't really think you were a joke. I, I thought you were, you know, a bit down with it. And and then shaking off the thought that you could do some kind of weight training. Honestly, I didn't think that was going to be possible. To then, obviously, now we've all seen you doing deadlifts and all that crazy stuff and the success of the at the Victory First Games and so on. What changed? What happened then? Who got in your ear? I know surround yourself with great people. That's how you do well in business and relationships and in life. So what got Mark the wake-up call to, to say, yeah, maybe I can go to the gym again. Maybe I can do martial arts. Not only martial arts, you're doing probably one of the most difficult challenges for those who don't much, know much about martial arts that there is, involving grappling, groundwork, kicking, punchings, um, chokeholds and everything very mm. famous martial art with serious people people who don't mess around these guys mm. are like proper pedigrees they yeah. back right so i'll let you talk about that mark so uh how the heck did that happen what changed um that, that it's hard that so many things man. like a, just a series of events like with the weight training i had a friend who owned a gym and he gave me a key and he used to let me go in there at five o'clock in the morning. Cause I was very conscious that when I like got on a machine, cause it took me so much time to get on it. I wasn't getting off it until I'd done my sets. I and mean, that's not gym etiquette, right? You, if someone else wants to use the pack deck, you get up and let them use it between sets. But I was like, well, no, I'm here now. So I'm going to stay here, but I didn't want to do that. So I would go in there at five in the morning when there was no one there, the gym wasn't even open and I would just play around. And it took me about six months to figure out my first kind of routine. And then things built from there. And, you know, it's a, a bizarre series of events. You know, I was speaking at a financial uh, advisors organization up in London. And I just read one of Tony Robbins books. And then a bloke at the end pulled out this massive folder of all these course, like the coursework pamphlets you get. And then they, they bought me a ticket. So I went on this course, on this three-day course, and then I'll, I'll, the short version of this is every next level I went to on these courses, and they're all around the world, mate, I bumped into somebody who went, I'll pay for your next course. And I did like 50 grand worth for these personal development courses and probably in the whole time paid about two grand for my hotel fees and that was it. It was so weird. Like people would just gravitate towards me and go, I want you to do your next one. I want you to do your next one. And so that led, you know, helped introduce me to a whole new world of personal development that I didn't even know about. So I started reading books, combined that with the, the, the weight training, 
you know, I was playing around with prosthetics, asking people, you know, can you run, swim, row, ride? What, what, can, what can I do? And I started playing around with these things. And then I was actually sat right here where I am now in my office at home in 2016, setting out my goals for the following year. And I realized that 2017 was going to be my 10 year anniversary of being injured. So I thought to celebrate, I want to do something that I've never done before. And although I played around with weight training, running, bike riding, swimming, I'd never competed at any of it because it, none of it interested me. Like my background, as you know, was martial arts. I didn't care about running the 100 meters or doing the long jump. It just, none of that floated my boat. But I had seen my friends go to the Invictus Games. They, I think it was two years old at the time. And they come back with medals and, you know, all this success, which was cool. But because I knew them outside of that, I saw what it did to their personal lives, how their confidence would soar and their, you know, their drive to want to go and achieve more would, would it soar. So I was like, right, I'm going to apply for the Invictus Games. Thinking I had no chance at all of getting in because I wasn't in any of those cliques. I just stayed away from sport after I was injured. I didn't do anything except for my own training. Made the team. Uh, went to Canada in 2017, which was insane. Came back with two silvers and two bronzes and the Jaguar Land Rover Award for overall best athlete. But my goal with all of this was to get gold. And I, I came home and I couldn't let it rest. You know, I, I was just like, I have to go back because I can't. My friend is just over there. You can't see it, but he made me a frame up with an Invictus flag in the middle with the two silver medals, the two bronze medals, and he left two gaps at the top for the golds. And I used to have that in front of me when I'm on my rowing machine at five in the morning on my hand bike in the garage. It's like one degree and I'm freezing. And I don't want to train. I just used to look at that and be like, I'm not going to the next one without coming home with golds. And just trained nonstop to go out there and do that. And I, I think I came out with four four golds, three bronzes and a silver the following year. You stole the show again. Yeah, but that, that was that little journey into, into Invictus. And then, and then there's a BJJ, mate. And this was a... a so Jiu-Jitsu, for people who don't know, is a very complex, all-round martial arts. So the style that's probably seen as more of a... It covers everything. And, and it's very difficult to get awarded grades in that. It's very traditional. And... Yeah. Uh, yeah, do you want to have one a little bit about that? Because you're you're part of a very high top group of that too, aren't you? Yeah, but it was just kind of similar to the conversation we had. You know, I was in the sergeant's mess at Royal Marines headquarters and I was approached by one of the physical training instructors who was a, a colour sergeant in the Marines. He was the head of Royal Marines unarmed combat. He was a, I believe, a purple belt in jiu-jitsu at the time. And he was responsible for introducing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to the Royal Marines. So he, he said, oh, you know, this is who I am. Do you want to come and train with me? Now, growing up, when you, you dabble in all these different disciplines, I tried Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, right? And I didn't know what the different. I didn't even know what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was. So I was like, oh, I sat there thinking, I can't throw. And I can't, you know, there was a lot of, I remember knife, you know, DR, uh, disarming people. And I was like, I don't think I can do this, but you know, you're a Royal Marine, you're a physical training instructor. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. So I went down to the combat room and then he explained to me that it was a, a grappling martial art and that you, most of the time you're on the floor and I'm like, perfect. I'm already halfway there. I've got no legs and I'm sat down. So let's see what we can do. And he kicked my ass for like an hour. Right. And when I finished, I thought I was going to throw up because my body wasn't used to rolling around and twisting and spinning so fast. But I got to the end and I was like elated. Like th this was something I thought I'd lost as well. That that feeling of, you know, having a, a tear up with another bloke and getting my ass kicked and trying to kick someone else's ass. And when he showed me standard techniques and we figured out how I could adapt them for, for me, I was just like, this is the thing I need to do now because this isn't this is going to be hard work and it's going to tax my brain my body and we're going to figure this out and I think I can legitimately progress to the the ranks here and uh that was like five years ago and now I'm at a stage where like I was training this morning with 
with Ricky, a brown belt. Uh, he's an army PTI as well. And there are just things that I can do, which are a huge advantage to me, which frustrate the hell out of other people because I don't have things that they can grab and I can just wiggle out of stuff and other people can't wiggle out. I never thought of that. Yeah. Like when, I, when I'm on the, when they're on their back and they, they get me in what's called closed guard, which is basically wrap their legs around my back and cross their feet over. That's very hard for somebody they wanted to get out of. All I got to do is literally pop up and twist my hips and whoof, I just pop out. And they're like, ah, and they're trying to, they're getting angry with me. And I'm like, well, you've got to take the, the rough with the smooth, mate. This is my advantage. So I'm going to use it. And How do just- you get around with it then, Mark? So I'm an experienced martial artist. So grappling. How does that work for you? you one arm. Way. So you got one arm. So your releases, I guess you do rely on an awful lot of like body movement that everyone else don't have, which I didn't think of before. Or yeah, I mean, there's a lot to it. Bring your way out of situations. A, a lot of it's for, for me personally. But like, what I see when I watch able-bodied people being taught is there there's techniques and there's ways you can do things. So for me, it's taking a technique or way that they do it and then using my instinct, knowing how my body works and figuring my own version of it out. Mm. And, you know, things like where I, I focus on what my strengths are. So, well, not my strengths, but what I can do. So when you're rolling around... Make it clear, you haven't got any equipment on, have you? No. You take all that off. No, I've got a gi on. And they've got a gi on and I use that very much. Take care off. Pro- no prosthetics. So you try like, say again. Does it work with them on, or is it just you just don't like that? It it wouldn't work. It'd be too dangerous for for both parties. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I use my hands like how someone would use their feet. So if I'm on top of somebody and I need to get up their body, where they would use their feet on the mat, I will grab someone's collar and pull myself up. You know what I mean? And I, and I'll use my pressure to kind of grind them into the ground. I mean, everyone does that but that's something I have to focus on because of my limited tools. So I'll, I'll be conscious. I use my head a lot and I even use my shoulders, like grinding them into people's sternums. This, we've just developed a choke where you can go in their throat with, with my arm stump and just grind it in there and choke people out. And like, again, there's, there's things that I can do, you know, with this, that if you had an arm, you couldn't do it because there's, you've got too long an arm. Whereas my little arm, can get into these places and really do some damage. I guess you're a bit of a pressure point expert too. I'm getting that. Yeah, yeah. I'm figuring it all out. And it's, well, I, I would imagine you'll, the people you train with are learning a lot from you on how to improve their own skills. So this is what Ricky, so Ricky is, he's a world champion. He just won the world championships last year at Purple Belt, just got promoted to Brown Belt, trains all day, every day, right? And he's phenomenal. And he had to develop a new guard for me because I kept getting past it so quickly, he had to develop a whole new guard and a whole new game plan to deal with me because what he does with people with legs, when he can get his feet and hook them in and do this and that with them, he can't do that with me because I don't have feet for him to hook his feet onto. Yeah. So he had to develop a whole new game plan just for me. So it's brilliant. So I've, I've not competed yet, but when I do, it's going to be difficult for people because I think I'll be competing against able-bodied people because there, there won't be anyone with my injuries to compete. Well, I'll be used to that because everyone I train with is able-bodied, but they're going to look at me like and go in with an able-bodied game plan, but then very quickly realise, I think, that yeah, this bloke's a pain in the ass because he's got nothing to grab. So yeah, Let me know when you're going to compete. I want to watch that. That's going to be very interesting. Well, it should be the 20th of August in Wolverhampton. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. Nice time. Uh, tenacious people I know. So, Mark, I want to just touch on some of the subject. I don't want to keep you too long because I know you've got a lot on today, but touch is- um, on things that we don't see. So in the world of Mark Wimbledon, what, what don't we see? So I'm 42 now. I think you're a little younger than me, right? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Go training. Don't recover like I used to. Get the muscle aches. Get the odd injury. Have to be careful. They're not I used to go over the dumbbells. You've got to throw them all over, not have to warm up. What don't we see when you're not on TV, on your Instagram, where you're training, doing these deadlifts? What impact does that have on your body and i'm sure you've had warnings from doctors about it's probably not known yet you know blood pressure or anything else what how your body's going to react to this intensity 
what don't we see behind the scenes? What goes on after these work? Has there been any disasters? Is there, is it, it's got to be a learning curve for you, right? That what's yeah. not being seen by the public about what you go through as a result of training for like the Invictus Games and. I mean, nothing that would shock you. I mean, I'm just, I'm very proactive in my recovery. So you see, I've got my whoop strap, so I'm constantly monitoring my data. I have morning routines, evening routines. So I get up in the morning, 5.15. You're big day. on that, aren't you? You're big on routine. Yeah, absolutely. Can you, you talk us through that? So people are like that. So I, I know what your routine is, but talk us through. You stick to that, don't you? Totally. Even yeah. through, when you had COVID recently, I saw you were still pushing forward. You, you got to, because for me, if I don't have a routine, everything goes to chaos. And I feel that like if I don't have a routine or have a plan for my day, week, month, and year, then I end up being a slave to other people's plans. That's right. You know? So I'm up at 5.15 every day, much to the annoyance of my wife. I'm straight into a 10 or 15 minute meditation. Then what I'll do is I've got a little coffee pot and as well for me everything is about efficiency and convenience so whereas you could walk downstairs very easily and flip the kettle on that's a pain in the ass for me so to save time I have a little coffee thing under my desk it's all set up I hit the button it takes about six minutes to brew so in that six minutes I'll get my foam roller out I'll stretch my back my hips everything I need to stretch um which is a really nice feeling I love stretching then the coffee will pop you know, I'll sit and sip that while I'm, I've already planned my day the night before, but I'll look through my schedule, see what I've got on today. I'm not, it's not perfect. I, I try very hard not to look on my emails at that time, but I end up diving into them. And then after the coffee, I'm straight in for a wash. The kids get up about seven, so I'm still ahead of them a little bit. Um, I've started for the last three, four months now. I'll have a warm shower. And then at the end when I'm clean, bang it on ice cold for like two minutes, three minutes. I, I stretch in the shower actually as well because I'm very short. I can stretch my hip flexors out and everything and try and reduce inflammation with that. Then it's teeth, legs on. My bag's normally packed the night before for training or for work. And so is the car if I've got to go on the road. I'll go out, you know, go straight into whatever my plan is for that day. It might be training, might be meetings, might be travel, whatever that is. And then... In the evening, I'll try and create a routine as well where I try not to go on devices after eight to try, so I can wind down. I've got it's a bit nerdy, but like blue light blocking glasses. I've got supplements for sleep. I've just started using a new one, but I use CBD oil. I've got these kind of things, uh, you know, curcumin and turmeric for keeping my joints healthy because of what I put my body through. And I just make sure that I eat well, hydrate well, and supplement well throughout the day to just be proactive with it all. And I'm a big, big nerd on sleep hygiene as well. So I've got blackout blinds in my room. I've got a mask that I wear sometimes. It's got headphones in. So sometimes I'll listen to like binaural beats while I'm falling asleep. Okay. I can track my sleep efficiency with my watch, make sure I've had a good amount of sleep. And if I haven't, then I'm not afraid of having a little 20 minute nap in the afternoon when that afternoon slump hits. Um, but again, I've just started getting a new supplement now, which should counteract that and, and help. It's a non-caffeine based one that will get me through the afternoon slump because I get up so early, but not affect my sleep routine because it's not caffeinated. So what time did you go to bed? At the latest half past 10. Normally what I like, I, I used to read in bed, but what I found was that I found it hard to sleep then because then I'm processing what I'm reading. So now, like, half past nine, I, I just stick on mindless TV, like, normally, like, Family Guy, and I just watch that, have a bit of a laugh, and then cruise to sleep at about 10, quarter past 10. Do you find CBD will really help? So I know that's a big, huge business at the minute, and I use it. It helps me, especially for sleeping. I love it, mate. It knocks me it. out, and I'm afraid the next day. You know, it's all these things that I used to wake up in the morning and the way I get out of bed, I, I turn a certain way and I've got to put my hand on the floor and, and drop myself out of bed. And I used to wake up and and I'm very strong and fit and healthy, but I'd notice like when I put twist on my body, it would go crack, 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 crack down my spine. You know what I mean? Which is a nice feeling. But ever since taking the CBD, yeah. it stopped happening. 
and I, I felt my, my sleep quality was better. Um, and I, what I generally do is if I do meditate in the evening, I don't always do it. I'll take it as I'm meditating, do the 10 minute meditation, then get straight into bed and I'm out like a light. I got a lot of friends who take it after workout to reduce yeah. their recovery time and yeah. information and it works great for them, you know. Don't really want to take it before work, actually be half asleep, but yeah. it depends on the dosage and the, and the quality of it. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because the top doctors say we got these receptors in our body for CBD and THC. Why have we got them there? Clearly it was used hundreds of years ago for whatever reason it was stopped. Yeah. But they're, they're in there. Our body's supposed to absorb this stuff. So I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be a bigger thing in the UK. So I think yeah. I'll get people off a lot of these antidepressants, sleeping tablets and all the other painkillers and all the other nonsense that they're taking mm. so well, let's, i want to hit you with something so if you could go back so i met my bully who was the, the motivator to my success i met him on live tv on this morning which for those of you who don't know is a morning tv show in the uk after 32 years we met together live on air it was a big hit yeah they, he's my anti-bully ambassador now and then he started training we went back a year later and he lost a load of weight and so on what would you say I'll give you two different types. What would you say just after the accident, sat in hospital, if you could meet the person who planted that that bomb, what would you say to them? Well, I know it's two years here, isn't that at the moment? But say that again. as Mark now, what would you say to them? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is that that gentleman no longer lives on planet Earth. They, oh, really? were, they, they were they were taken out within 24 hours i know that <laughs> three of them the three that were responsible um so i won that fight but um i don't know it, it's very very difficult because i am older now i am wiser and you know I'm, I'm not this is i'm not political at all but sometimes i sit there and think what how would i react if these people invaded my country and started, you know, putting their boots down on the ground and telling me what I can and can't do. I know it's very different because they were like terrorists, but I just, I try and look at things very, very differently now than what I did when I was 19 or 24 when I was at war. And it was all like, yeah, let's kill, kill the bad guys, you know? And I'm not saying they weren't bad guys, they absolutely were. But I think now if I met that person now, I would react very differently to the way I would have done before. Would you want him to be dead, Mark? Say again? Would you want him to be dead? Or do you think there's an understanding there of the situation? Now or back then? Now. Honestly, I'm not bothered either way. Like, I look at my life, sometimes, I, and I don't do this in a negative way, but I look back and I think, what if this didn't happen? And what, what I want him to do was attempt special forces training, right? Which... And I, I've got a lot of friends in that world. I don't know if I would have done it or not, but my ambition was to give it a go. I know the life they live. So if I was successful, Becky probably wouldn't have stuck around. I probably wouldn't have my two other kids now because I would have been off and she wouldn't have been able to speak to me for months on end. Mm. Now, although what happened in the beginning was really shit, and like I said, I lost my career, my then everything, it set me on a path now where actually my life's pretty phenomenal. Like you said earlier, I get to hang around with, you know, really cool, high profile people, celebrities, film stars. I get to do what I love every day and train. I'm constant. I'm in this position now where I, I, I answer to nobody but me. I've built over those 10, 11, 12 years things that give me freedom where I can go and do what whatever I want with my life. And I've got the best, prosthetic care available in the world so life isn't as bad as people might think it is but that being said it's been a shit ton of hard work to get here like this it's not been easy at all you know but yeah, i am very happy financial, the financial impact i had on you initially was was kind of restraining you wasn't it too it was mm. a bit unfair i felt mm. and um that was probably getting you down at the time more than your injuries, I think. Not being out to provide so, your family like you want to. If I'd have got these injuries as, as a civilian, I probably would have got like a seven or eight million pound payout. Like the girls right. at Alton Towers who lost one leg, I think they got like 6.1 million each. I think that's for one leg. 
I, I got enough to be able to buy this house that I live in. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. It's like you can buy a house and that's enough. I think a lot of people um, don't understand that. So um, people might think you're a multimillionaire. You must have had a massive payout from the government. That's what they think. It's not. But the then same, it? the, the funny thing is, go back to what you asked me earlier. You know, what don't people see? What what is it when the cameras are off and everything? The the business entrepreneurial side of things, I have been grafting at for over a decade now. Do you know what I mean? To get where I am, and I I wouldn't say I'm successful because you know, I look at you and you know people that we were talking about off camera and look at them and I'm like that's the kind of level I want to get to and it it is honestly right I, I don't have to work a day in my life ever now for the rest of my life ever I could stop now and me and my family our, our quality of life would, wouldn't change right so it's not so much about the money what I want to do is get millions of people all over the world that are suffering maybe, maybe lost a leg maybe in a wheelchair who think that they're going to have to live on welfare for the rest of their life and be like well no actually it will be a shit ton of hard work but this is what i've figured out you know we live in 2022 i can run a business from a mobile phone from a laptop i can do any you know i have 15 zoom meetings in a day whereas before you had to travel around the place to do them you can do everything now on your mobile phone so there's there's zero entry to the game. Do you know what I mean? And if I can figure this out, which is what I've been trying to do for a couple of years, then anyone can figure it out. And I'm a Marine, you know, I used to eat crayons for breakfast. If I can do it, anyone can do it. You know? So, brings me to the next question. So we've got some geniuses out there, love him or hate him, Elon Musk and people like that are pioneers. Mm. There's already been some breakthroughs now on curing blind people, about deaf people being able to hear again. And they're not that far away, they think, from, from recreating limbs and stuff. So if someone was just to offer you, Mark, you can have an operation, have your arm and legs back, what would you say? I, I think I would do it. So knowing you, you do it for your family. That's what I think, knowing you. Well, also, I mean, if I say if it, if it was a success, I mean, look how many people that would help millions around the world. Do you know what I mean? And I often think that now. I think to myself, if I had this mindset and this physical ability and I had my legs not, because I used to be able to do all sorts of stuff, mate. Like, you, you know, with the martial arts, I could do the splits. I could do like, the running up walls and all sorts of crazy shit. And I'd love to be able to do that again. I think if I could have that opportunity to do that again with the way I am now, I'd probably be 10 times the athlete, the soldier, everything that I was before. It'd be really interesting if I could experience that I, think Becky, yeah, I, I would absolutely do it i could be more worried about you then than what she is now yeah that's what yeah, yeah. that's for sure you stop. so i can't let you go without asking you about prince harry and Meghan markle i get asked about them a lot i i met them well, i met um prince harry in uh cheltenham okay he wanted to meet a famous friend of mine i found him to be a lovely guy really nice guy and yeah without breaching privacy and i think um Obviously, there's been a lot of controversy over him turning up the games recently. You've met the guy. He loves you to bits. I know that. And um, I think you're very fond of him. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you make of this whole situation where everyone's turning their, their back on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle? In fact, I think you were there when he, she was initially announced, right? In Canada, I, I think you were. Which is the first public appearance of Prince Harry. Man, I was at their wedding. I oh, was at their wedding too. Yeah, I yeah. Saw, yeah. Mate, the... the you know they're lovely the time that i spent with them like genuinely and it, it kind of it annoys me a little bit right so the first time i met prince harry was shortly after i was injured and for 10 years plus after that right he couldn't do a thing wrong everybody loved him right and everyone said how great he was and for good reason but then all of a sudden they all turn and it's like that sheep mentality everyone's like oh well he said that he's this so i'm going to say that as well and it, it's it really annoyed me when i saw it in the media everyone's saying this and that and, and i think you've completely forgot about all the good that he's done all over the world and in his circumstances and his situation and you know how many people comment and know what it's like to grow up in the public eye as a member of the royal family with all that pressure on you as a losing your childhood and all that none of them know those pressures but they judge you know what I mean? And none of them have probably met him. The guy is awesome. 
like genuinely, I've, been, I've sat in rooms with him where he's put his security outside and anyone official outside and had proper bloke to bloke chats. And he's a genuinely cool guy. Absolutely. It just, it, it's really annoyed me the way that people have flipped on him like that. I'm Megan. We only met briefly, but again, lovely. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, before they got together, I was actually watching that whole Suits box set and she was on that. And I was like, no way, that's the girl from Suits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny everyone, I always find he gives you his full attention. He's just, he's just one of us, he's just normal. Yeah. And you are right, he never had a choice to be born into that mega stardom, did he? No. And then he lost his mum at an early age. And I, mm-hmm. all that stick he got recently about turning up at the games, I mean, that's his, that's his thing. But this is my point. This is one of the things he did. He, he created the games. Obviously, you know, the people around him helped him build it and, and get it where it is. But look how many thousands of people and their families, that's how, including me and mine, all across the world. And it will continue. they've now just announced Invictus Winter Games. So then you've got another demographic of people and that will continue and continue and continue. And that's his legacy. And people were giving him stick for turning up at it. It's his train set. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's changed thousands of people's lives. And, you know, we talked about suicide earlier. It saved thousands of people's lives as well. Because without that, without sport, these people would have gone off the rails. He don't just sit down and watch, does he, Mark? No. No, he gets stuck in. He poke, encourages you and... yeah. Thanks you and takes time out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's very unfair, but you get that with fame and and uh, superstardom, and and I think with Megan too. I think her heart's in the right place. They don't want to be part of the royal family no more. Then it's their life. Yeah, you know, exactly. they they can do a lot lot more for for, um, for good for that. And I think it is a shame. And remember, the Queen is the Queen to us, but it's to him, it's just his grandma. That's mm. what it is, you know. But yeah. Well, I hope that will improve. So at the wedding, when you were there, there was no indication to you that it was gonna, he was going to leave the world. It all felt, felt quite naturally natural to you. And yeah, did you think maybe that they would go and live in America and it wouldn't? I, I had no clue, mate. Um, but it was like a Hollywood, Hollywood ceremony, wasn't it? Really? There was, there was a lot of Hollywood people there, yeah. But I mean, you got to do what you got to do, didn't you? It's very yeah. weird. Like when you, when you, well, you know this, you know, when you grow up and you get married and you have a family, you know, thing, everything changes and your focus is taking care of them. You know what I mean? The best way that you can. You know what I mean? That's, that's what you have to do as a husband and a father. And that's what he is, a husband and a father. He had to do what is best for him and his family. And if that meant, you know, going to America, cool. You know what I mean? What was nonsense about not giving him security? I mean, he should be given security. It's not his choice. He wouldn't. He's born into the situation. Yeah. He's protected like anybody else is. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sad one. But um, you, you get to see him behind the scenes and the real guy and what he's about, without all the nonsense, the twisted headlines. And I guess I must irate you and get you very upset sometimes. But uh, for you, what he's put on is just completely changed your life. So what's your highest points of your li- life been, Mark? Oh, what's God. Your, what's, what's your highlight? If you could put it so far... Oh, you're really proud of. I know there's a few things you've. Uh... Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know, mate. Like, it comes really thick and fast, and which is great. You know, I get to do so much cool stuff. But the Invictus yeah. Games is one of them. The NBA must be the big one for you, right? Yeah, that that was cool. That was cool. But it, at the same time, it, it felt a little bit because I got it for working with the Royal Marines in the veteran community, right? Mm. But that's what I do. This is just like living my life. So it kind of felt a little bit like, I'm not sure why I'm being rewarded for just doing what I love doing anyway. Right. Do you know what I mean? Um, but that being said, it, it was a huge honour to, to get it. But this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. This is always going to be a part of me and who I am and my story and legacy is working in these communities and, and trying to do what I can to help people. You know? Yeah. Worst point in your life? Um, probably those two we talked about. Like that, and what's really good is that they are two very small blips on the radar 
that I don't ever see resurfacing. It was just two little moments that I got over very quickly. And ever since, it's just been forward, just forward progression. So, Mark, what happens when you go out now? You've had a lot of attention and you create attention anyway just by the way you look, obviously, because people mm-hmm. see you, if they could see you in with your uh, prosthetics on and stuff. How do people respond? And how do your kids understand that as well with their daddy? A bit different. Because I, I, I take it you can. I know you went to a beach not far from me because I live in North Devon at the moment. And not so long ago, well, last summertime. What happens? Um, I mean, it's cool where I live, you know, because I grew up here. So I get lots of... of you, aren't they, there? Yeah, I get a lot of nice comments from people, um, local and actually, now, like all around the place when I travel, you know, the beach you're talking about, you know, I put my little legs on there and I look very strange, especially the children. Um, and people, taking, going, people taking pictures from afar and stuff. and Yeah, but I don't give a shit. You don't care. I honestly don't care. I couldn't care. I'm in my little bubble at that point where I'm out for a day with my family and having fun. I don't it's care what anyone else is doing. Do you know what I mean? You can take photos all you like. I, I, doesn't bother me. Um, they, I mean, I, why are they taking a the photo? It might be for a good reason. You know, I could automatically assume, oh, they're, they're taking this to make fun of me and put it on Facebook. They might be taking it, taking it to the school children and go, look at this guy at the beach. You know what I mean? Be brave or don't give up. Or, you know, it's, it could be sending a positive message. Mm. So I just, I just like ignore stuff and I'm in my bubble, mate, doing my thing. They used to people staring. People come up to you and say hello. Is that, is that the general? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, non-stop. Which it is because I'm so busy. Sometimes it's a little bit like, ah, I need to go. Let me go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm on the way to a meeting. Just took your pre-workout. You're buzzing then. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Doing selfies. Yeah. But it is cool. You know, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, something you never imagined would have happened, mate. Eh? It's uh, incredible. That's over the kids. How do the kids look at their daddy and? I suppose two of them don't know you different, right? If I remember rightly. All of them don't, mate. Kezia was two years old when I got injured. She was two, wow. So she was just about three, uh, nearly turning three. So she doesn't remember any of it. Um, actually, her granddad on her mum's side has only had one leg. He just passed away, but he only had one leg since she was 19. So she's grown up around it. So, so haters, trolls... Do you experience that on Twitter and stuff or not? Oh, mate. Uh, TikTok's brutal. That's really? the worst, mate. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what you've been through. Yeah, again, but I just, I'm, I'm big enough and ugly enough to take it, mate. But like TikTok's quite bad because it's got a very young audience. And uh, what are they saying? What's the type of thing they're saying? Like they're make, taking the mick out of your appearance? You, you always get the same shit, right? Like you post up a video, you're working out. And it's, it's actually very boring now when someone, you know someone's going to go, yeah, but he doesn't train legs. And it's like, oh, for fuck's sake, you're the first person ever to say that, smart bloke. Or, you know, when I'm doing a deadlifting, because I wear my short legs, you know, oh, you haven't got very far to lift it. And I'm like, dude, that's 125 wow. kilos. I've got one arm. My, you don't, what they don't see is all the issues. Like the way where, I, where my little legs, my feet placement has to be almost perfect I have to tense up inside my sockets. I have to engage my glutes at a certain point. My back has to be in the right position. My arm could be this tight or this loose, and I've got to adjust on the go. There's a million things that I have to do just to get one good rep. But they'll go, oh, you haven't got a lift to lift it very far. So I, I, I don't care, mate, anymore. It's just like they're ignorant. And the, the ironic thing is, I bet if I went in the gym with these people, I'd wipe the floor with them. And then want a picture of you. So yeah, yeah, maybe at the end when they're yeah. when they're dying because their cardio is so bad, I'll be like, right, no more comments. I went to a martial arts show once, and the organizer he used to run a martial arts illustrated magazine, a guy called Bob Sykes, the editor. I didn't want to go because of the trolls and the haters. He said, "Oh mate, it don't work like that." I turned up and had a queue of people wanted pictures of me. Mm. It was like I was working all day, and he came over to me. He said, "You know those people who troll you." It's that person in the queue, that person in the queue. They all wanted the picture. They get behind their keyboard and they think they're something else. But where 
when they're actually with you, they want a picture with you. They want yeah. to talk to you, engage and say they've met you and stuff. It's a very strange situation. But yeah, it's very sad to think, though, that you, you would get it. And you can see why these people, these young people commit suicide, out, older people and, and celebrities like Caroline Flack and people like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to bring this attention because it's Mental Health Month, but you can understand it, can you? I mean, it's what she must have read. It must have been horrendous. For the someone you've got to, remember, to get abuse, I mean, that's just sick. It really is. You served our country. The thing you've got to remember with when people start talking shit online is, is you know, what's going on in their life? That they they've got a, they think they're gonna they're gonna take the time to check out your profile, check out your post, and then put something shit on there. You know what I mean, there's obviously something going on with them for them to want to do that rather than be like happy for whatever it is you're posting, unless you're posting douchey stuff. But that's that's the way I look at that. I'm like, there's there's something wrong with this. You know, it's like in real life, people talk shit about me in real life too. People that used to be my friends, right now, and and they're in these little circles that I operate in, talking shit about me. But I'm like, I'm first of all, I'm confident and happy that I do 99% of everything that I can in my life with honesty and integrity and good intentions. So I'm not bothered about what they say. But second of all, I'm like, well, why are you saying that? Like, what's going on with you to cause you to want to go and make something up about me and try and spread these lies about me? And I just shrug it off and laugh, mate. And what I find in, in real life, what you find with people like that is they spend all their attention on you if you spend all your attention on yourself, you do this and you move forward in your life and they stay stuck and they just keep focusing on you. And I'm focusing my energy on me and what I want to do and my goals and my accomplishments. And they're focusing their attention on me and they're not doing anything with their lives. And then five years down the line. Yuri Geller summed up because he used to get to me once. He said, mate, they're your free publicists. And they're, they're spreading their word, commenting on you. They're pushing your content out there. Yeah, the algorithms for you for free. Let them go ahead with it and go and have some fun with them sometimes too, you know, and engage with them a little bit because it's for them to search you out, take the time to comment on you. They, they've got a problem. They, they're mm-hmm. a fan of yours. Otherwise, they don't like you, then they don't follow you in the first place. But Absolutely. yeah, you, you used to say free publicist, and that, that's the way I see it now. I kind of, I love, I love it. You know, you could buy followers and stuff. If I, if I could buy haters, I'd buy them. Mark. Yeah, they, they, well, they mate. Bad, really like. You think about it, you're in their head. Like when you're going about your business, like spending time with your family or working or working out, they're like, ah, ah, God, I hate Mark. I hate Matt. Why do they do that? And you're just getting on with your life, having a great time. And that's why I'd sit there and think about stuff like that. I'm like, they're sat there in bed at night angry about, I don't know, my success or what I'm doing in my life. And that's that's amazing. It's like, put all the comments you want on there. Right, you know, act, show off, do whatever you want in front of people online. But at the end of the day, when you go back home and you turn the light off and get into bed, you got to deal with this. And, and mine's clean and clear. Yours is like full of toxicity. Yeah, yeah. It's a good way of explaining it. Mm-hmm. Well, so what's next, Mark? What's your plans? So I, I am trying to get my second book over the line. I we've got a movie in the pipeline. Um, based on my first book I've got the jiu-jitsu competitions coming up um, and then lo- loads of events coming up mate I'm travelling around uh, under the Reorg banner with a charity that I'm a trustee of um, doing loads of events uh, spreading the word spreading awareness and you know promoting the mission of those guys and I just keep you busy mate and like I say in the background trying to do all these entrepreneurial things to bring in some other revenue streams and build them and yeah. constantly networking and meeting people. And, you know, I've got 80% of a plan and then 20% I'm just hoping for like a bit of good luck and um, serendipity. So how do people find you? If they want to contact you, if they want to follow you? Not on TikTok. <laughs> um, you know, I've got my website, markwormrod.com. I'm on all the social media platforms. Handle's always the same, at Mark Ormrod. I'm on there daily. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok. Um, so, yeah, they can find me pretty easy. How, do, how can they find the uh, documentary? That's particularly good. So you can either buy it on Amazon or you can go onto my YouTube channel and get it for free. Uh, it's pinned to the top of my YouTube channel. 
It's streamed on Amazon Prime, right? Still. Yeah. I believe, yeah. It's very hard to find on there, though. You've got to put my name in. You've got to put Matt uh, No Limits in. You've got to search with a couple of things. Uh, it's probably easy just to get it on my YouTube channel. Okay. Go and check it out, everyone. It's a good... Uh, it's a good watch for any sparring. Well, Mark, it's been great to have you on here, and I will get down. We're both in Devon. I will get down to see you at some point, and we'll go and have a workout. I'm not going to do any grappling with you. That's not my thing. I'll stick to the kicking and the punches. Right. So I think I'll be quite safe with that, actually. I don't know. You probably yeah, won't yeah. have that one out, I'd imagine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it'd be great speaking to you, and you thanks too, for coming mate. on. Keep up the good work. It's an inspiring story. You too, mate. Thanks very much. Thanks, buddy. Cheers.